Amen. While you're finding your seat, if you'll get your Bibles and turn again with me to Psalm 24. This is the final lesson in the series, The King of Glory. Enter the King of Glory. This will be part three this morning. Over the last few Sundays, we've looked at this psalm um, that was written by King David. And I'll remind you that it was written as a celebratory song for the occasion on which the ark of God was being restored to Israel. Uh, this event was significant in the history of Israel, and it represented a national and spiritual milestone for the chosen people of God. Um, I also want to suggest that perhaps this was the crowning achievement of King David's reign. Okay? It opened the way for generational blessings and, and the context um, in which this song was written and sung, it's also the context in which we um, remember David for being an ardent worshiper, having um, uproarious praise. It, it said in 2 Samuel 6, 14, and David danced before the Lord with all of his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound and the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, which was his wife, looked through a window and saw the king David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Sometime later, they're having a conversation about this, and, and, and David says, um, or Michael says to David, um, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants and as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me before your father. Okay, so he was going with it. And before all the house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord and I will be yet more vile than thus, and will be based in my own sight, and of the maidservants which you have spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. I believe there's a song that we sing um, uh, about David where I will dance, I will sing before my king. I'll become even more undignified than this. Essentially, he's saying to, to Michael, listen, when the king of glory comes into a room, when the king of glory comes into a place, everybody's title can fall to the ground. There is no king but one. When the king of glory comes into a place, then whoever you think you are, just forget about all of that. Because he's worthy of absolute worship. He's worthy of absolute adoration. He's worthy for me to lose my mind in praise because he is who he is. And so he, he just had to let her know that my reputation means nothing in the sight of God. Okay, he says in another psalm, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. This is the king, the one that should have the front row seat. He says, just let me be at the back door greeting people if I know that the king of glory is going to come in and his train will fill the temple. And so, so, so this situation here, again, this surrounding Psalms 24 was very significant in the life of David. And over these last couple of Sundays, there's been four points that we've discussed. Number one was that, that we can have confidence in God. Number two, which was last week, we discussed the fact that we need to be having a godly pursuit of him. We need to be chasing after him and, and went through those verses in this song that, that talked about the qualifications of the Levites who had to pursue the Lord. And then this morning, I'd like to focus on verse number six, a generational declaration. And then the end of the psalm, uh, the, the last point, a divine invitation. And so let's just read Psalms 24 again. If you're there, will you say amen? amen? All right, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Salah. 
Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Salah. Amen. All right, so let's begin this morning in verse 6 with a generational declaration. Again, David said here, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Salah. And I actually want to start maybe at the, the, the back end of that verse um, to, to help us this morning with this word that he uses, Salah. It's at the end of the verse, and if you've ever read throughout the Psalms, you will see this verse scattered throughout the Psalms. And many of the Psalms, you'll see this word with a period right behind it, Salah, S-E-L-A-H. It, it means to lift up or exalt. It actually is a technical musical term, okay? Uh, remember, this psalm is a song. It was sung. There was music. There was lyrics to it. But it's a technical musical term that means this is the point in the song where we accentuate something, where we pause or perhaps where we uh, allow for a, a musical interruption. You all know how we sing songs here. Sometimes we sing the chorus, we sing the verses, we come back to the chorus, and before we go to the bridge, that's the hot part, if you don't know what the bridge is. The bridge is the hot part. Okay, before we get to the hot part, maybe we have an interlude, and they'll just play on the piano, or they'll just play on the bass, or they'll just strum some things. And, and sometimes it, uh, we, we just have that musical interlude. And, and for us worship leaders, we, we, when we practice, we'll say, okay, we're going to get to this part, and then maybe this is the part where we will free worship because we're going to free you from the lyrics on the screen, and then you can just make up your own words. We want to have a purposeful, intentional pause for reflection, or for the lifting up of the voice to exalt the Lord based on the truth that we just had been singing, okay? So this is a pause that's going to come up. It's a time to reflect, to think about what was just said. It's a time to stop singing from the lyrics and to simply let the music play while you allow the truth to sink deeply into your heart. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you done that in a song? The, the, the musicians have stopped singing, or the, the singers have stopped singing, the musicians are playing, and you just stand. And maybe you pray your own prayer vocally, maybe just in your heart and in your head. And so this Salah is here because this is a point where, where the musician or the songwriter is letting us know, when we get to this place in the song, I want you to stop and think so that you can come into a point of agreement with the truth of the song, okay? So before we even get there, I'm going to say that now so that you can be thinking about what you have to stop and think about, all right? And so in, in this verse number six, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Salah. There's four words that I want to pull out of this, and I just gave you the first one. It was the Salah at the end, but it's generation, face, and Jacob. And, and let me just keep working backwards, and we'll talk about Jacob. He says, this is the generation of them that seek thy face, O Jacob, Salah. In some translations, your Bible may say, this is the generation of them that seek thy face, O God of Jacob, Salah. And so we're not actually talking about Jacob necessarily, but we're talking about the God of Jacob. One of the things that we have to recognize in the scripture is that God has many titles. He has many names. And often as you go throughout the Bible, we will see where God attaches his name to a person. That's important. How many would like God to be known as the God of Jan, the God of Kathy, the God of Mark, the God of Brian, the God of Shabaka? Okay, I want, I, I don't know, it just, I don't think it's too crazy, but I want him to attach himself to me. And be known as my God, okay? Usually when that happens in the scripture, we got to be responsible and stop and say, why did God attach himself to this person? 
because usually the circumstances surrounding that attachment um, have some implication of how God wants to be attached to us. And so who is this Jacob? Jacob was the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. Abraham it was that received a covenant promise from the Lord, a promise that said, through you, I'm going to bless every single nation on earth. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. Um, this promise was passed from Abraham to Isaac because the blessing didn't come fully in Abraham's lifetime. So it was passed down to Isaac. Isaac births two sons, Jacob and Esau. They were twins. Esau was the older. Jacob was the younger. And so when this happens, uh, Isaac ends up passing on the blessing to the younger Jacob. The Bible says in one place, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, because Esau despised God. He despised the covenant promise. He despised all that the Lord wanted to give um, to that family line. So Jacob received this blessing. But the problem is that Jacob is a mess. Jacob is a mess. I won't even ask you to raise your hand this morning, but has your life ever been a mess? Jacob was a mess. He was, he was a big mess. Jacob was a thief. Uh, he was a liar. He, he was an extortioner and a cheater. He, he, he lied to his brother. He lied to his father. Him, he, he had his mother wrapped up in manipulation. He, he, he skips town after he's caused a whole bunch of friction in the family and moves in with, with his, his uh, uh, uncle, um, his, 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 his mother's brother, and, and then he tears up that household and, and, and has a problem with women. He ends up um, having children by four different women, and none of the kids can get along, and, and all these women are messed up in their emotions because of his antics, and he's a thief and a, and a, a liar and a cheater and, and deceptive. But somehow, he's supposed to carry the blessing of God, a liar, a cheater, manipulator. His name actually means supplanter. Somehow, this supplanter is supposed to release in the earth a blessing for all the nations. Okay, this, this Jacob. And, and, and he's just, he's a massive mess. I just want to encourage everyone this morning, regardless of how messy your life is, if you will do what David is saying in verse 6 regarding this generational declaration, if you will seek God, if you will seek the face of God, he can take your mess and turn it into a miracle. He can take the dysfunction of your life and cause it to lead you to a place of destiny because that's the type of God that he is. In fact, we, we see this happening in Jacob's life. In Genesis 32 and 24, it says, and Jacob was left alone. Okay, let me, let me back up. Jacob is at this point where he's now alone because he's done all this damage and it's now time to to pay the piper, so to speak, and he might be killed. He's not sure what's going to happen. He's guilty. He's caught. He's fearful for his life, and he's all alone now. And it says, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Okay, so Jacob is, is trying to return home, does not know what's going to happen. The Lord sends a representative from heaven, and he's wrestling with Jacob. Jacob is stubborn and fighting, will not let go all night long. So essentially, this representative from heaven socks Jacob in the thigh and causes the muscle to shrink, and now he will be crippled in some capacity for the rest of his life. All right, listen, God knows how to deal with you. And if you, listen, if you've been a mess your whole life and it seemed like everything has fallen apart and God has come to contend with you, don't be stubborn. Don't fight all night long. Just submit, okay, and walk with the limp that he gives you because it will be a, a reminder for the rest of your life as it was for Jacob that I cannot do this on my own. The blessing that God wants to release through my life, I cannot carry it on my own. If I were to walk in my own stead, I would mess it up, manipulate it every single time. It says here in, in verse 26, he said, let me go for the day breaks. 
And Jacob said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, your name. And he said, wherefore is it that, that you do ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. My life is preserved. So although I was a mess for years. Okay, and, and we literally mean years. Dick, Jacob was probably well over the age of 50 or 60 when this situation happened. So for years of his life, his, almost his entire life course, he had lived in a dysfunctional way. He had lived hurting people and abusing people. And all of a sudden, God comes and he changes who he is so much so that you now have a new name. Come on, how many are happy for a new name in Jesus? I'm not what I used to be, but I have a new name. A new identity is granted to me. And so out of this new identity, Jacob realizes this is so significant that I have to name this place. And he names it the face of God. The face of God. So when David has put all of this into the song, into the lyrics, this is the generation of them that seek thy face, that seek you, O God of Jacob. He's not just making up stuff and trying to, to have rhyming words or stuff that sounds good. He knows his Bible history. He knows the history of his nation. He knows that when we were a mess beyond a mess, God, because you pursued us and we were allowed to get into your face, that's where transformation happens. That's, that's, where, that's where we can be changed. That's where we find a new identity. Again, he says in this verse, in, in verse 6, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face. Listen to, to this phrase, seek thy face. Seek, to seek the face is actually a, an action of entreaty. Usually throughout the Bible, it was used as a request for an intimate interaction with royalty. You would seek the face of the king. You all know the story of Esther, how Esther wanted to, to go in and, and ask for life for her people. She had to go before the face of the king. Okay, She had to be able to come into the throne room and, and to have access to his face where he would look upon her with favor. So to seek the face is an action of entreaty. Usually it's reserved for those who want it to be in the presence of royalty. To seek the face is also um, contrasted in scripture as the opposite of seeking someone's hand. So I don't just want to seek what you can do for me, but I want to seek your face because I'm really interested in being in relationship with you. And so when, when David is putting this into the song, he's not just saying, God, come and bless us and save us from our mess and, and, and be nice and give us blessings. But God, come really and allow us to be in relationship with you. Allow us to enter into that intimate space of your face. How many know that the face is an intimate space? Come on, the face is an intimate space. Would you look at your neighbor, look at them in the face if you dare, and tell them that. Say, the face is an intimate space. Come on, the face is an intimate space. There's a whole lot that can happen <laughs> in the face. Much that can happen in the face. If we would dare to seek the face of God, would be a life-changing event when we find it. There are several prominent features of the face that lead to transformation. Let, let me just share a, a few of these with you. We don't have time to go into them all, but the, the first one, if you look at, again, look at your neighbor's face, just real quick, look at them. You don't have to stare at them. Don't mean mug them. Just look at their face. Okay. W one of the prominent features of the face and y'all try not to laugh. Don't laugh, especially if you're looking at your spouse. Do not laugh right here. One of the prominent features of the face is the forehead. It's the forehead. 
And, you know, some of y'all that don't like your forehead, you try to hide it with a whole bunch of bangs. And, and we understand that. Um, some of you all who might be in a situation like me, your forehead is growing year by year. <laughs> with the receding hairline. But it impacts your overall experience with that person's face. Okay. It's a prominent feature, and, and it, it represents to us a hardness or a fixed state of mind. Have you ever heard of someone who was hard-headed? Okay. Who was bullheaded? Who 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 was you know resistant? They you know just stood against you. They had a hard head. Listen to this in Ezekiel three, eight through nine. It says, "Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads, as an adamant hardener, harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house." The forehead representing a hardness or a fixed state of mind or a fixed mentality. It says in Revelations 20 and 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no place found for them. Why was the earth and all of the heaven fleeing from the face of God? Because his forehead was set. His mind is made up in that verse about judgment. And so one of the things, lest we be confused, that it's all just flowers and roses, is that when we begin to seek the face of God, that we really are saying, God, we want to come into contact with the things that you have made up your mind about, that you are not willing to change or to be dissuaded on, because we know that you have a hard head. And if your head is set, who can stand against it? God, I don't want to be confused in this generation. Because my government is telling me that same-sex marriage is okay. And that that is politically correct and all right. And listen, I'm not bashing anyone. I'm not speaking ill against our government at all. This is all that I'm saying, though. If you would seek the face of God, his mind is already made up. If we would seek the face of God, his mind is already made up. There's some things that are irrefutable. There's some things that are irrevocable. There's some things where his, again, as it said in that verse in Ezekiel, that his, that his head has been set like flint. So David puts it in the song. God, we want to seek your face, God. This is the generation that will seek the mind of God on controversial issues. And then by your spirit and by your grace, we'll be prepared to stand. I ask you this question this morning. What is God's heart and mind set against? What is it irrevocably set upon? I ask that question as an invitation and a challenge to you to find the answer. How do you find the answer? You seek the face of God. You seek the face of God. You seek the face of God. Because if you and I would dare to get into the face of God, there is no confusion when you enter that intimate space. Sometimes it's confusing way out here. Sometimes we can't see as clearly when we're at a distance. But if we would dare to draw close to him, confusion has to dissipate. Second prominent feature of the face. So you have the forehead. I'm just... I'm going down in a, a linear fashion. You have the forehead. The, the, the next and maybe the most prominent feature on anyone's face are the eyes. Are the eyes. It's been said that the eyes are the window to the soul. And that, in fact, we say that so much that people think that there's a scripture that says that. There's actually not a scripture that says that. But in Matthew 6, 33, there is this illusion of that. It says the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. 
okay? And so like a window would allow light into a house. And, and, and maybe if you were standing on the outside of a house and you could peek into the window, you would see the furniture. Maybe you would just see the curtains drawn, but you might see drawn curtains. If they're open, you could see the furniture. You could see the room. You could see the, the decor. You could see the state of that house by looking into the window. The same thing is true with the eyes, is that you can see, sometimes you can see what is inside of a person when you look into their eyes. I remember when my children were, were infants, one of the things I would love to do most with them at two and three and four and five and six months, uh, when they would just lay there, is I would just, I would love looking into their faces. And they would just, if they were awake, obviously, they'd look back at me and, and I would just, I would take in everything that I could from their eyes. You know, at that age, uh, 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 that stage in the game, they were innocent. So I was looking at an eye where there, where there was no lying that had ever happened. It was there. They could do it. They were born and shaped in iniquity. But there was such innocence and purity. I could, I, you know, I could look into the eye of the two-month-old that had never, ever talked back to me. Clarity. I'm telling y'all, Clarity. I would love to look into their eyes and just, just see the purity and the innocence that was there. And, and, and it was, you know, sometimes I would stare so hard that I would begin to see my own reflection in their pupil. And it was awesome when they would just look back at me and almost as if they were studying my face. It was, again, the, to be in that proximity of the face and to lock eyes with someone is a very personal thing. And, and you can see a lot of times when you look into the eyes, you can see the emotions that are there. Have you ever, you know, had a friend or neighbor and you just had one look and you caught their eyes and you could see that they were mad as a hornet? You, you could see it in the eyes, Okay. Have, have you ever, you know, done something crazy and your mom just cut you a look with her eyes? And she didn't have to say nothing, but the eyes said, if you do it again, I will jack you up. You, come on. Just the eyes could communicate a lot. You could see the emotion. You could see the intention and the thoughts behind the personality that you were gazing at and into. The same is true with God. If you ever lock eyes on him, my goodness. You will be changed. It says in at least three places in the scripture, in the book of Revelation and also in Daniel 10 and 6, that Jesus' eyes are always described like a flame of fire, purifying. When we look at him and we realize that he's looking at us, there is no lie that can stand. Come on, every, everything you know you need to work on, you know it in an instance. Because his gaze is upon you. It actually says in, in 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Let me just help us with, this, with that verse this morning. Is The eyes of the Lord, he's looking throughout the earth. I love this verse. He's looking to and fro. He's scanning. He's scanning the crowd. He's, he's looking in China this morning. He's here in Bethel this morning. He's looking in the south and in the north and all over the world. He is scanning. His eyes are looking. You know what he's looking for? I realize this. He's looking for somebody that will look back at him. He's looking for people who won't be afraid and say, I know God is there, but I'm totally just ignoring him. Come on, this is the generation of them that seek your face. I'm looking for you, God. Find me. Lock eyes upon me, God. And cause me to know the emotions of your heart. Cause me to know the thoughts of your mind. Father, I'm looking to you. Lock eyes with him. You'll realize he's been looking at you all along. God, I want to see your face. I'm seeking your face. The, the other point of distinction of the face, so we have the forehead, the eyes, the, the, the other point of distinction, it is the mouth. And perhaps this might even supersede the distinction of the eyes, but it's not just because it's, it can be framed with, with, with a beard or a mustache or accentuated with lipstick. It is because the mouth, it is the element of the face that gives voice to what the eyes and the forehead 
know, and communicate. So God, I'm seeking your face because inevitably, if I can find myself in the face of God, the voice of God is to follow. And if I can see him and hear him, then truly he is with me. In Psalms 29 and 4, it says, The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the hinds to calve and discovers the forest. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. His voice is powerful. And so when I'm seeking the face of God, I'm also saying, Lord, I want your voice. God, I want to hear you on this. I want to know what your opinion is on this matter. I don't want to make it up. I don't want to pretend that I think that I know. But God, I want to hear your voice. So again, this is the generation of them that seek thy face, O God of Jacob, Salah. Let me settle here with this generational declaration on this actual word, generation. In Webster's Dictionary, it says that a generation is the entire body of individuals born and living at about the same time. Okay, so we are all in this room living. Most of us have been born in the 20th century, and so we could be considered, in, in a very loose way, a generation. Okay? It says the term of years, roughly 30 among human beings, accepted as the average period between the birth of parents and the birth of their offspring. And so if we go with that definition, then we have multiple generations in this room. We have, you know, um, uh, Grandpa Palmer and Grandpa Bear that would represent a generation. They're now in their, their 80s and 90s, and, and, and um, you know, they've had offspring that are now old enough to be my parents. Okay, so then that tier would be another generation. I'm 36 years old, and so if you think about all the people in their 30s, and maybe we stretch down to those that are 25, and we stretch up to those that are 45, that would be considered a generation. Um, uh, the definition also says a group of individuals, most of whom are the same approximate age, having similar ideas, problems, attitudes, and so forth. Okay, and so maybe we have even a whole nother tier of a generation. Everyone that's under the age of 25 and they have grown up with devices and haven't grown up with telephones that have cords attached to them or TVs that you, um, you know, that you, that you operate with, with remotes. They don't know anything about having to turn a dial on a television, okay? Um, that we have a generation that don't know anything about popping popcorn without a microwave. How many remember popping popcorn Without a microwave, you had to get the skillet and put grease in the skillet and had to wait for it to heat up. We had to do this way back in the Stone Age, y'all, and, and um, put grease in the skillet. It had to get hot. Then you put the corn in there and you had to stand there and shake the pan. We didn't have a microwave to do that, okay? Um, that, that's, that would be a whole nother generation, this younger generation. Okay, that, that have cell phones and iPods and iTouches and all this type of stuff that, you know, uh, that don't remember cell phones that were as big as this Bible when they first came out. Okay, they used to be this big, okay? Then they got real small. Now y'all trying to make them big again, thinking you're doing something. You ain't doing nothing. We did that already. <laughs> okay, that would be maybe another generation, okay? Uh, it also says that, that a generation are the people of the same period or living at the same time. It, it could be a genealogy, a series of children or descendants from the same stock. Okay, here's just a few verses about generations in the Bible that speak to these definitions. In Exodus 1 and 6, it says, And Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. So all the people that were Joseph's age, they eventually died off, and, and then there was another group. Exodus 20 and 5 says that God sometimes visits the iniquity of fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. So you have the fathers, their sons, and their grandsons, and then their great son, great grandsons, different generations. Um, Jesus said this in Luke 9 and 41, oh, faithless and perverse generation. Meaning you group of people right now, 
how you're living in general as a group, same group of people on the planet at the same time. You're faithless. You're perverse. Psalm 78 and 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. So again, he's speaking to this generational transfer, this, this, this truth that is happening. And, and, and David says, again, this is the generation of them that seek him. So God, we recognize that we lost the ark 80 to 90 years ago. And it's been off in the corner. In one place, it, it actually says in the Bible that no one was inquiring of the Lord during the reign of King Saul. Because the ark had been shoved into the corner. We understand we've lost it. And so we have, we have an 80-year spread, God, where there's at least two or three generations that have gone through life in this nation devoid of seeking your face. But because of your goodness, remember last week, because you are helping the Levites as we pursue you. Father, we're at a point now where we're bold enough to proclaim and declare this is the generation. I don't care what my mama did. Not concerned about the vices and the sins of my grandfather. All of those curses that would seek to be passed down, I'm going to break right now with a, general de a generational declaration, God, that this is the generation of them that will seek him. In my life, in my time span, in the years that you've given me on this planet, God, I will pursue you. I will seek your face. This is the generation that, that seeks him, that will seek your face, O God of Jacob. It says in Psalms 14 and 5, there they were in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Psalms 22 and 10, a seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Maybe you're the only person saved in your family. Still stand and declare, this is the generation of them that will seek him. Psalm 73 and 15, David again is speaking. He says, now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not. Can, can I put it in, in the Shabaka Williams translation? God, when, when I get to the stage in life that Grandpa Jay is at, God, don't forsake me. When I get to the stage of life that, that Pastor Palmer is at, God, don't forsake me. God, now that I am old and gray-headed, oh God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power unto everyone that is to come. Psalms 145 and 4, one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. Isaiah 51 and 8, but my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. Joel 3 and 20 says, tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Another generation. Luke 1 and 5. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. And then we know this verse. We love this verse. First Peter 2 and 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I want you to think about that. Remember, the Salah is coming shortly. I want you to think about this fact that God has allowed you to be on the planet for such a time as this. And regardless of what's happening with technology or with politics, with wars and rumors of wars, with the government, with the culture, with fads, with what's acceptable and what's in and what's not, with where the state of the church is and, and all those different things, regardless of all of those factors, everyone, God has allowed you and I to exist on the planet for such a time as this. Amen. And I, listen, I get excited about this. Instead of bemoaning everything that's wrong, why don't the people of God rise up and just begin to declare, God, you know what, I know everything around me is a mess, but this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek the face of the God of Jacob. This is the generation that will pursue the God that can bring transformation and change. This is who we are. Disregard, everyone. Disregard all the other labels. 
that the world might ascribe to your generation. You might have been a baby boomer, and they went busted. You might have been Generation X, and they lost and confused because they don't know what X is. You might have been a part of the MTV generation, and y'all all messed up because of the worldly, demonic, crazy music that MTV brought to you. You might be the millennials who are full of rebellion and lost and mad because your parents was all messed up and jacked up from MTV. You, you might be this youngest group that we have now. They're calling Generation Next and Generation Z, okay, or the I generation because they got an iPhone and an iPod and an iTouch but don't know how to communicate with people, all right? You might, you might be a part of any one of those generations. Let me tell you this. Reject every lie that's associated with, with those generations and stand up and declare, God, I'm a part of the generation of the righteous. I'm a part of the generation of those that seek your face, of those who are in a relentless pursuit. And then comes the Salah. Stop and think about that. Stop and think about it. And then the, the psalm or song goes on. So we come out of this interlude. And usually when we have those musical interludes, we come out and we hit a hot spot. We hit a hot spot. Remember I told you, we're coming to the hot spot, to the bridge that we all like to yell and sing. And it's the mantra. Here's the mantra of this song. Listen to it again in verses 7 through 10. And I'm going to hurry here. It says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty and battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Salah. This part of the song was actually probably sung antiphonally. It means as they were going through this parade, you had a group of Levites who would sing, who is the king of glory? And then you would have another group that would sing in response. It's the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Then another group would say, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. They're singing and shouting back and forth, declaring the Lord's praise. And David is giving us very simply here a divine invitation. He's saying after you have realized that you can trust in God who has the whole earth, it's his, and after you've purified your hearts and your soul and, and gone through all those processes we discussed last week, and after you've resolved and declared that you are a part of the generation that will seek the face of God and you've found yourself in that place, in his face, when you've locked eyes on him, you know what you can do when you've locked eyes on God. You can say, King of glory, come in. King of glory, come in. King of glory, come into my home. King of glory, come into my workplace. King of glory, come into my family. King of glory, come into my marriage. King of glory, come into the lives of my children. King of glory, come in. And then you say, well, who is the king of glory? Listen, the king of glory is described in 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. He is the one that is in charge. The king of glory is the one that's in control. The king of glory is the one who's decked in splendor and in majesty. And when I invite him in, if he would dare to come in, he can show himself strong. So David begins to use all of these words about the king. He calls him the Lord who is strong. This is a Jehovah name. Jehovah is us, means the Lord my strength. He says he's strong and he's mighty. That's Jehovah Gabor. The difference between strength and might. Strength means he has the power, he has the ability. Might means that he has the heart to do it. So he's going to stand up for what's right. He'll be your defense and your strong tower. And then the last thing that he describes is, who is this king of glory? He says, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You know, host represents the fact that, that he's the captain over an army of angels. 
and over an army of the righteous. And that this army that he commands, they obey him relentlessly. There's no defection in the armies of heaven. There's no disobedience in the armies of heaven. And whenever the children of the king have need, he dispatches his armies to come and to fight on their behalf. And so I'm, I'm saying, come in, king of glory. Come in, Lord, strong and mighty. Come in, the one who is mighty in battle. You've never lost the war, great king. You're undefeated. Your victory is unparalleled. Why don't I invite you to come into my nation? Why don't I invite you to come into my home? Let me just tell you in closing what happened. David writes this psalm. They have this event. The, the ark is brought into the, the nation, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, David begins to seek the face of God. He begins to train the Levites and the other worshipers in the nation how to seek the face of God. And they begin to do this continuously. They're seeking his face, entertaining his presence, and continuously inviting the king of glory to come in. And out of the face of God becomes, comes the voice of God. And he speaks to David and he says, I promise you an eternal place with me because you sought me so hard. And that's just your spiritual blessing. But the physical blessing that happens, you can read about it in 1 Chronicles 18, 2 Samuel 8, 1 Kings 2 and 4. The physical blessing that came because the king of glory who was strong and mighty in battle, he came in. And, and the Bible describes in those chapters how David whooped up on every one of his enemies. God gave him victory 100% across the board. God did it. Not David. God did it because David invited him to come in as the king of glory. And listen, the king of glory just didn't come in to give him physical victory over the enemy, but he brought sustained peace, so much so that the peace ran over. You know, David ruled for 40 years. There was so much peace, so much glory of God that it ran over for another 40 years, and his son Solomon enjoyed pervasive peace. And in that peace, the temple was constructed. The glory of God came to rest and to dwell physically with the people. And it was the greatest reign, it's the greatest reign that we know of the nation of Israel. Let me say this in closing, church. I dare you to invite him in. I challenge you to come to the point of a general dec generational declaration and to begin to invite the king of glory into your life and our lives and our situations so much so that he responds to us <laughs> with such goodness and blessing that it cannot be contained in this generation, but it has to flow over and be manifested in the next. Amen? Amen. Amen. Will you stand and let's pray. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, at the Selah, at the end of Psalms 24. And Lord, we are inspired to stop and pause to reflect and to think. What would happen if you came in? God, what would our community look like if you came in, King of Glory? What would every marriage in this place look like if the King of Glory came in? How would our children grow and thrive if you came in, King of Glory? What would happen to sicknesses and disease, God, if the train of your robe filled the temple of our bodies, God? What would happen, great King of Glory, if you were invited in? to save the lost, Lord, and to manifest yourself throughout the nations, what we can only imagine. And so this morning, Father, we dare to pray and to declare that we are the generation that will seek you, that we will seek your face, O God, and we ask that you would come in. We invite you. God, we invite you for these next moments that we'll have in a church service. But, God, beyond a service, we invite you to come into our lives. We invite you to come into our church. We invite you to come into our families. We invite you to come into our workplaces and every space that we would occupy. King of glory, come and have your way. Come with a blessing so great, God, that we cannot contain it. That it would overflow and that generations would be changed and transformed and impacted, Lord, because you came in in this season and in this day. Father, we love you. Bless everything that happens in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen.